Great. All right, we'll start with our blessing. And before we do that, I'll go ahead and, and mute everybody. And then please unmute when you have a question or comment. Be great. Okay. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech, Haolam, Asher Bachar Banu Mikol, Hamim, Vina Atan Lanu et Torato, Baruch Ata Adonai, Noten Hatoram. This week is Shabbos Shira, Parsha Bishalach. I would say every Parsha is one of my favorite, but this is really one of my favorites. It's such a great Parsha. This is really a Parsha that focuses a lot on women uh, in a number of ways. Number one, it focuses on women because we have the uh, Miriam song. And so we have her song. So she is part of this week. Also, the Haftorah is Deborah's song. And in Deborah's song, it also features the, the actions of a woman named Yael, who was the one who successfully killed and beheaded the the general Sisera of the um, army with which the Jewish people were in, in war and was caused the turning point, in fact, the winning of the war. <clears throat> so it really features the women. In addition, it's not just Miriam at the Song of the Sea it, because it says she went with all of the women, that it wasn't just a, a solo performance and that her going and dancing and singing with the tambourines was a reflection of the women's faith and trust in God. And I learned something really beautiful. It says that, that the men sang after the crossing of the sea. And it starts out as Yeshir Moshe, then Moshe and the B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel sang, meaning afterwards, which is amazing and great. And we say the song of the sea every single day. So it is a huge thing to be able to give thanks and recognition and praise to Hashem for the salvation that occurred at this crossing of the sea. However, it says that Miriam and the women, when did they sing? They sang while they were still in the sea, while they were crossing. And to be able to sing and thank God while you're still in the middle of the problem and you don't know for sure how it's going to turn out, that's a whole other level of faith and trust. So I just thought that was fascinating. <clears throat> so sometimes women complain, women are never mentioned in the Torah, which is first of all, totally not true as I think probably our studies have hopefully demonstrated. But it's interesting that there are particular women that are mentioned and then it mentions the women the Jewish women as a whole who were all on such a high level. And I'm sorry, you can't really list 600,000 women's names. It's not really possible. So you just say Beit Yisrael or Beit Yaakov, the women of Israel, the women of Jacob. When the men are mentioned as a group, honestly, it's usually for something negative. It talks about the men who participated in the sin of the golden calf, the men who believed the report of the spies etc. So it's not necessarily, uh, that's when they're mentioned as a group, it's usually for something negative. Uh, when the women are mentioned for a group, it's um, always a compliment and something that is uh, beneficial and inspiring and amazing that we did or are doing. So just as an aside for that. In addition, also this week, another mention of women is the manna starts to fall. And God calls the manna lechem. He says, I will rain down for you bread. And he uses the word lechem min hashamayim, bread from heaven. But it says later in the description, it says, and Beit Yisrael, the house of Israel, called it man. So the women named it. Um, all the other references to the Jewish people kind of throughout Torah and most references are B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. So when the text makes a complete switch and says Beit Yisrael, our sages notice that and say that refers to the women because bait meaning house of and the word bait being the same word as bat of like a bat mitzvah of the women, the girls, the, the females, the women of the Jewish people. They are the ones who called it and named it man. And the reason they did is because that is that word man is kind of like the internal letters of the word emuna. So emuna, which means faith and tr and and trust. So Marsha said, I guess I've always been confusing. The timbrel is the same as a tambourine, but a timbrel, it's not clear what the instrument was. I have to say, 
it's um, some people say tambourine, some say timbrel, some say drum, but it, whatever it was, it was something that was a musical instrument that they prepared while they were in Egypt as an act of faith and trust. On our women's trip to Israel, that God willing is on, if anybody wants to join uh, Patricia and me um, going, we're leaving on uh, February 14th through the 24th. One of our activities, one of the things we're going to do is there's a woman who does like a tambourine workshop where you get to make your own Miriam's tambourine. So very fun and uh, get to do that. So this is like, so whatever it was, it's the fact the men did not dance and they didn't have musical instruments because theirs was more of a surprise. Surprise, God saved us. Whereas women were like, I knew this was happening. I'm already making my jamboree I'm already practicing my dance. Uh, so they were, did it. But when they started, this was while they were in the water, while they were still in the process of going. So going back to the manna and naming that, the word man, so it's translated as mana in English, M-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, but the Hebrew is mem nun, man. That's how you say it. So those two letters, mem and nun, are the central letters of the word emuna. Emuna is aleph, mem, nun, he. So it says man was the essence of emuna, which totally is true because it was to teach the Jewish people to trust God, to sustain them, that it would only come once a day, and it was enough for the day and they could have none left over and they got a double portion on Shabbos. It addresses all of the essence of human anxiety of where's my next meal coming from. So this is where's my paycheck coming from? Where's my meal coming from? Where's my whatever's coming from? Uh, it's all nervousness is embodied in the mud. And that was to teach the Jewish people to have faith and trust in God. So why does it say the women named it? It said, because it takes one to know one. Says they named it because that's who they were. They recognized that and they called it man. It says it's the woman, it's the Jewish woman's role is to teach emuna, to teach faith and trust in God. Um, a child says, um, whether you've had a child or not, it's still the same. It's like that, that is the essence of a woman is to do that. The word for a mother is an aim. Aleph Mem, the first two letters of the word Emuna. It says that's the, the root of it. It says that a baby learns that when they're born. A baby is born, unless they have difficulties, born knowing how to suck. It's like this, like, where's, where's my breast? You know, where's my bottle? Where's my something? Where's my food? That's the baby's main concern. And they learn to trust their mother or their food provider. However, that's still called mothering to provide that food, to nourish that in that way. And that is called to learn emuna from your aim. So who better to name the man, man, than the mothers, than the women, the, the Jewish women who named it that. So this is like so chock full of, totally chock full of women power here, the women's piece. And we know in the Talmud, it says, in the merit of the righteous Jewish women, the Jews were redeemed from Egypt not in the merit just of Miriam and the merit of the righteous Jewish women. So as a whole, this is our shining, our shining week. Um, there are others as well, but this is one of the highlights of them. Now that all being said, what I'd like to talk about is something that doesn't necessarily have so much to do about women per se, but has to do with a closer look at the splitting of the sea. Um, I remember hearing this was a report, they did a radio show asking people, if you could live, if you could be a witness to any event in history, what would you want to, what would you, what would you want to see? And somebody who wasn't Jewish said, I want to, I want to see that split into the sea. You know, I want to see that because that just like defies everything. So that's what they wanted to see. So the splitting of the sea, which we already mentioned, we recite the, the Song of the Sea every single day. That's part of the morning davening. If you're ever feeling, especially even if you don't have davening as part of your thing, you're ever feeling like, ha, huh, I don't know what's ahead of me. I don't know how I'm getting through this. Recite the Song of the Sea. Because like that's about the going through. Because it says for the Jewish people, unlike the way it was portrayed in the movies, where it just split, it says the Jewish people had to walk in. And first, Nachshon ben Aminadav was the first person who walked in, it said, above his nostrils, and then it split, an act of pure faith. 
And then the Jewish people walked in and said, but for each person, I don't know exactly how this worked. It was like a zipper. It, uh, it split as they walked through. It wasn't like, oh, I see a clear path to the other side. Now I'll go through. Each step was an act of faith because you don't know, is the next step going to open up before me? It's like, you don't know that. Each step was an act of faith. So tremendous. Not only was it an act of faith, but you could say the fear would be increasing because the farther you go into the sea, the farther you are from the shore. So it'd be like your risk increases, your faith actually increases with each step you take, but that that's how it worked. Now, again, what that means exactly, I don't know, because it also says that the walls stood up like walls, that the water stood up like walls. Um, there's some beautiful illustrations of it. There's all sorts of illustrations according to different midrashim. And we would just say yes, and yes, and yes. All of that is, it's all true. And I don't know how it all fits together, but it's all true address, addressing different aspects of it. So going back to the sea splitting, the question is, why did it split? Why did it split? The Jews were being chased by the Egyptians, their backs were against the sea, and then the sea splits. Why does it split? So in the Midrash, it says that the sea said, I don't wanna split. God, you created water where you created water, and I'm supposed to be a sea, and I'm supposed to do with this. Like, why, sh why should I do that? Now you could say it's not really a good idea to mouth off to God, and if God tells you to split, you might wanna just do that. But it says that the sea argued back and said, why should I save the Jews and then come back on the Egyptians? This one worships Avodazara, worships idolatry, and these worship idolatry. They're both the same. Why should I have any kind of preference over one or the other? Because we know that it says the Jewish people had reached the 49th level of spiritual impurity, whatever that exactly means. And the Egyptians were on the 50th. So I'm sorry, if you have somebody who has an F and an F minus, you're really going to differentiate in that significant of a way. You all save, you drown. So the river, the sea was like, I'm not going to do it. So it says, then what happened is that the sea saw the bones of Yosef, the bones of Joseph. Okay. Now, how do we know the sea saw them? So it sounds like Seesaw, the sea saw them. When we recite Hallel, which are the songs of praise, which come from primarily from Psalms, and also at the Seder, we also recite Hallel. One of the Psalms that we say is Psalm 114. And you probably may, might be familiar with this from the, with the song, but say Yitzrael, me Mitzrayim, Beit Yaakov, Me'am Lo Eis. And if you do it like in a little back and forth uh, harmony, most people are focusing on um, coming in at their time and getting the song right and getting the words right, and not so much on focusing on what the words say. But the words say, when Israel went out of Egypt, Jacob's household from a people of alien tongue, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominions, the sea saw and fled, okay? And the Hebrew words are, and this is gonna be important because we wanna hear what these words are because we're gonna see this word someplace else. Hayam, the sea, ra'a, saw, vayanos, and fled. The sea saw and fled, okay? Why is that? It says the sea saw and fled. And what did it see? It saw the, what, it's like, what did it see? It saw the bones of Joseph. Okay, what does that do for us? Okay, the sea saw and fled, that word vayanos. That word, it says, what do we know about Joseph? What did he do? What was his great spiritual accomplishment? So it's interesting, just as an aside of how in the Jewish world, we ascribe greatness. So we know he was the leader of Egypt. We know that he saved the entire Egyptian economy. We know that he forgave his brothers. We know that he was, you know, all amazing dream interpreter, leader of the Jewish people. But he's called Yosef Hatzadik, Joseph the Righteous One. Why is he called the Righteous One? What is it that he did that we say is like the most significant thing of all that he did? 
Anybody want to unmute and say you are welcome to? Like, what did Joseph do that was so great? Forgave his brothers. So yes, he forgave his brothers, which was so incredible. And But interestingly, he is not called a righteous for that reason. There was something that was even more, more difficult than that. Resisted uh, Potiphar? Exactly. Potiphar's wife's advances. So that she was like uh, trying to seduce him, maturing him. I don't know how she was dressed. She, I don't know, like some of those things, like I don't know if she came to the door in saran wrap or what, but she was like, she was trying to get him and he was very attracted to her. He was a young man who's by himself. He's not with his family. You know, you're in Las Vegas. What do you do? You know, you're in a place where things, you can do whatever you want. And no offense, Anne, you're in Las Vegas, no offense. But some people just kind of use that as a joke. Um, so um, it's like, what does he do? It says he comes very close to caving in because we know he got close enough because she grabbed his coat when he fled. And if you go, if you have your chumash with you, you can see the words that are used. Uh, on page 215, this is Bereshi, Genesis chapter 39. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, it's actually on the next page. Um, page 217, verse 12. She caught him, she caught hold of him by his garment, which means it wasn't like across the room, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and he fled and went outside. And the Hebrew that is used for that he fled is vayanas, and he fled. The same as the waters, that when the Jewish people fled, when the Jewish people came to the sea, why did the sea split? Why did the waters flee? It says they fled before the one who fled. It says that seeing Joseph's bones, and the words of, of bones are atzamot, are bones, and that's related to the word etzem, which means like the essence of something. Joseph's bones reflected the essence of who he was. And when the sea saw his bones, it says he went against his nature. It wasn't like he was like, um, you know, like, oh, you know, she's kind of ugly. She's kind of whatever. She's not my type. This was something where he had to go so against his nature and the drive. I mean, all you have to do is look in the world as like the sexual drive seems to be like undoing just about everybody and that he resisted that and fled. So the C says he went against his nature. I'll go against mine. And it is in the merit of Joseph fleeing that the C splits. So beautiful. Now, do you think Joseph even knew so he said, you know what, if I flee here, then the Jews in the future, the sea is going to split. It's like, do we, and that was just one person. Look at the magnification of that. You have one person fleeing one scenario and having that impact and being called a righteous person based on that. And it has this magnification ripple effect in history that 210 years later, the entire sea is going to split for 3 million Jews, you wouldn't expect that big of a return on your investment. You would expect like, okay, so, you know, midah, connected midah, measure for measure, there'll be like a little bit of something. You did something great, someone else, I'll do something great for you. Not one person does one thing in one moment and that that triggers a response a couple hundred years later that is completely out appears to be completely out of proportion. If we had any clue what the impact was of our actions, we talk about a ripple effect, but honestly, when we talk about a ripple effect, I don't know, I've thrown like a rock into a, a lake and you see like the ripples. First of all, the ripples kind of peter out after a little bit. And that's not like that. It's not like a, I throw in the rock and then it turns into like a tsunami. It's a, like, it's just like, okay, it's a ripple. But when we realize that we cannot see or perceive the magnification and the ripple effect 
that goes on in the world at a level that we cannot perceive, we would conduct ourselves differently, both what we refrain from doing and what we do do. We learned that the Jewish people received the, the manna. So what was the, why did we get manna for 40 years for 3 million people? So in the merit of Abraham feeding the angels, who came, the people who came to visit, it was like, it just gave him a meal. I just gave him like, you know, a snack. I didn't give him so much. Nope, God counts that and magnifies it. We understand that. We say that in the attributes of God. We say, God preserves acts of chesed for thousands of generations. And we say that we are, we are repaid for chesed. It says we collect the fruits in this world and the principle remains for the world to come. It's like, I can't even begin to reward you for that cup of coffee. I can't even begin to reward you for the smile. I can't even begin to reward you for your restraint when you said no. I can't even let you see it because it's not possible to see because it's gonna ripple through history and ripple through time. And it's not that you, you won't be able to even take it in. So the Jewish people, when they saw the splitting of the sea, it's like, that's what they saw. And they saw it from Joseph's bones. So the sea saw it and fled and it went against its nature so the Jewish people could pass through. Questions or comments just on this incredibly awesome experience. Who knew you had so much power? You know, they always talk about, you know, like whatever you have your finger, like on the, I don't want to say like the nuclear option. We have our finger on the pulse of the entire cosmos and the things that we're doing that are affecting the world are really be staggering, really staggering. Comments, questions, anything just about that? I'm gonna take that in. It's really something, really, really something. So what this also says is that we have tremendous leverage. So sometimes people say, oh, you know, the Jewish people are so small. We'll never be able to really get the whole world, whatever. It's like, don't worry about it. That's what leverage means is, and it's so, it's so fascinating, right? You know, you touch a little bit here and it leverages something beyond what you could possibly do as an individual. We cannot comprehend it. So this was Joseph's bones and this is what happened. Yes, Patricia. I don't know if anyone saw that thing that was going around Facebook and stuff with, uh, with, the, with Sydney Poitier and- Oh, I just saw that, you know, I, I, I didn't read it. So tell us more what it's, I just well, saw the he's, heading. He's asked why, when he was, he, he really was illiterate and he was, a, he was um, washing dishes and wanted to be an actor. And this, uh, this waiter said to him, you know, he had a paper, what it, what's in the paper? He said, I can't tell you, I can't read. And he said, well, would you like me to teach you to read? And he was a Jewish man. And he, every night after work, he would stay for, for weeks on end and taught him to read. And then here comes this fantastic actor later on that blossoms, changed his life. He had tears in his eyes when he was telling this story. So incredible. So incredible, right? I, tell you, I still remember seeing him in To Sir With Love, like one of my all-time favorite movies. Oh my gosh, that man is amazing. Really something. So thank you, Patricia. So yes, and you think that person probably thought, you know, he's like, first of all, it was amazing that person did that. That was like very generous. But you think it was like, okay, you know, it wasn't like, you know, you're not gonna like get the Medal of Honor for that. And yet the lives that have been changed and the ripple effect and who was in, and how do we know who was impacted by him? other black actors, other black people, other, you know, whatever, other anybody people. And that just keeps going and going and going. So to have this in mind, this is why we say this, we recite this every morning, again, with the Song of the Sea, we say every single morning, acts of chesed, these are the precepts for which you enjoy the fruits in this world, but the principle remains intact for the world to come because it's beyond our ability to track it. One of the beautiful things is that we'll be able to see this. After 120, when we go to the, the big um, meeting in the sky in the heaven, it's like, you get to see. You get to see what you did and you get to see what you didn't do. So you get to see the impact of the good and you get to see the impact of the not so good. And it's a pretty overwhelming experience. You get to see the whole thing. 
It really is. And it's so it's it's wonderful when we have an opportunity to catch a glimpse of even just like a snippet of one of these choices and what it leads to is phenomenal. Really incredible. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Okay, so then going along also with the splitting of the sea, we have two uh, like words that key us in, you know, how many times have we read this? We've read this a zillion times. It just constantly blows my mind of how much there is to the, the depth of everything that is here in the Torah. Okay, so we've addressed the Joseph and his bones and what his bones actually did and the power it did that caused the, the sea to split. Now, the next thing I want to point out is that um, before Joseph dies, while he's still back in Egypt, this is the end of the, par the, end of the book of Bereshit and Parsha Vayechi. On page 289, this is chapter 50, uh, verse 25. Um, we'll do verses 24 and 25. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely remember you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph adjured the children of Israel, saying, when God will indeed remember you, then you must bring my bones up out of here. We have talked about in previous classes that um, the exodus, the redemption from Egypt was, I heard this rabbi um, say this today. I think he was uh, Rabbi Farhi saying the Exodus, the redemption was password projected. You ever try to get into one of your accounts? You don't have the password. And then it's like, oh, and you try everything you can think of and every variation you can't get in. There was a password that the redeemer was going to say that would let the Jewish people know that they were the true redeemer and the redemption was going to start. And that phrase was going to be pakod yif kod. When God will indeed remember you, Pakod Yif Kod. That is what Moshe is going to say to the Jewish people already 210 years later. He's going to say this, these words, and that's how the Jewish people know that he's not a fraud. So that's a whole other story that we talked about with Sarah about Asher. But what we want to also say is that it was in the context of saying, of Joseph sharing what the password was for this redemption that he then says, then you must bring my bones up out of here. So it seems to be, and this one way of looking at it is, whoever this redeemer is, is going to be the one who also takes my bones out. I'm abjuring all of you, I'm making all of you swear, but it's, I'm, I'm making you swear that when God does this and sends this redeemer, that redeemer will take my bones out. So, and that is in fact exactly what happens and it happens in this week's Parsha of Vishalach. So if you turn to this week's Parsha of Vishalach, page 367, uh, says verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him for he had firmly adjured the children of Israel saying, God will surely remember you and you shall bring up my bones from here with you, okay? So Moshe is doing exactly that. Now, in English, we only use, we have the word with, W-I-T-H, and we use it like for any meaning of with. In Hebrew, there are two different words for with. So if you um, know Hebrew, if you want to take a look at that, um, it is tet, and so there's a yutet in the margin of the Hebrew. And it says, Vayikaf Moshe, and Moshe took et atzmot Yosef, the bones of Yosef, imo. Imo means with him, ayin mem vav. He, because hashbea hishbia, he was, um, he was sworn to do this. Uh, that means he was definitely sworn to do this. Uh, et b'nei Yisrael, to the Jewish people, lay more saying, Pakod yif kod, God will surely remember, Elohim, you, um, God, etchem, you, vaha'alitem, and you shall take up out with, take up out, et atzmotai, my bones, mize, from here, eat chem, with you. Now, so the two words are, if I wanted to say with me, 
I could say it two different ways. I could say ET with me or ENI with me. What's the difference? ET is I'm taking my purse with me. EME is I'm taking my thoughts of you with me. ET is external. Yeah, I'm schlepping it along. Yosef only said, take my bones with you. Like, get the box and take me with you. It says Moshe took it, emo, with him. Im, internally. So what does that mean? It says Moshe's way of doing a mitzvah was to internalize it and to take it to not just to take it seriously like oh, okay i gotta go get joseph's bones like he made me say promise it's like i have to take joseph's bones that's my responsibility and i moshe will be transformed and impacted by this mitzvah that i'm doing because it wasn't such an easy thing to do because where were joseph's bones joseph's bones according to the midrash were in a lead casket sunk in the bottom of the, of the sea of the nile like, okay, honestly, halachically, he would have been absolved of that. He would have been absolved as like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. The same way we learned that when Avraham sent Eliezer to go get a wife for Yitzchak, and he says, take a woman, take a girl from my, my family, my home area, and bring her back. And Eliezer says, what and, and swear to me you're going to do this so he swore he says but what if she doesn't want to come with me then Abraham says then you are absolved of the of the of the oath you can only fulfill something that's possible to do you can't say well i can't i i can't do it so now what am i supposed to do moshe took this so seriously and how he was able to raise it up i actually haven't seen the midrash maybe somebody else has on how he got the bones up because um, I don't know how you get anything out of from the bottom of the of a the Nile, especially in a lead casket. That's not really going anywhere. So, but he brought them with him and he got them up. So it says that he took this and he took it to heart. It says this is a message to us. There is a phrase, and I did honestly, I did not catch where the rabbi said this phrase is. It says, "Chacham Lev, a wise heart, yikach mitzvot, a wise heart takes mitzvahs." What does that mean? It takes mitzvahs and it's on, it's the commentary on this verse right here, because where it says that Moshe took the bones, 19, Vayikach Moshe et Atzmot Yosef, that Moshe took the bones of Joseph. It says a wise heart takes the mitzvah. He took the bones, not just like he took them, he took them. It says when we have a mitzvah opportunity in front of us, we can react one of several ways. It can be like, oh, you know, I guess I have to do this. Or, okay, I'll do it, check. Or we can say like, oh my gosh, here is a mitzvah opportunity for me that is standing in front of me, big or small, doesn't matter what it is. And I'm taking this to heart. A chacham leiv, a wise heart, yichach mitzvot. A wise heart takes to heart a mitzvah. And then the mitzvah has the power to be emo or emi, with me, in me, not just ET, not just like in my handbag, I'm schlepping it along. So people say, you know, I don't get anything out of davening. And, you know, you people then usually look to say, is it the rabbi? Is it the cantor? Is it the temperature of the shul? Is it the person talking behind them? Everyone has like their own story. But the question is, what did you put into it? Like, are you showing up like you bought a ticket to a movie and you're waiting for Sidney Poitier to entertain you? Or are you doing something? It's like, did you take this to heart? What are you doing? So that statement is always more, it's more telling about the person than about anything else that's going on. So it says, a wise heart, yikach mitzvot. A wise heart takes mitzvahs. So it's interesting, that same word is used for marriage. Now, people don't like to hear that because it makes it sound like the man takes a woman. It makes it sound like he, you know, hit her over the head and dragged her off, you know, by her hair into the cave. That's not what it means. Like, vayikach, and he took her into his heart. Not just like, okay, this is my, you know, well, trophy wife here. It's like, I'm taking you into me. We are bonding together. That's what it means, vayikach. Vayikach Moshe. 
at Atsmotio safe. And he brought them Emo with him. And then he takes them to the sea and then they can, then they work their magic. But he, as the redeemer, was the one who was supposed to do that because that was what Yosef said. So he takes us to heart. He does this and the sea splits based on who Yosef was, but not just based on who, who Yosef was, but also who Moshe was. Because if people would have just said, okay, we got the bones of Yosef, I guess we're good to go, you know, be like, I'm not sure that you still have the merit for this. But it's like, no, we're taking Yosef with us. That's a whole different story. So it's interesting. This is not at all at that level, but just like the difference between taking and taking. As we're going through things in our house of what we're taking with us to Israel and what we're not, it's funny how I feel about some things. There's some things like we're taking our, 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 um, our what's it called? Not stainless silver. The other kind of the good silver, whatever. What's my kids? It's like went out of my head. What is it, Andy? Sterling. Sterling. Sterling, that's the word. Our sterling <laughs> silver. Okay. Now, thank you. <laughs> I'm in the partial, but I'm not like in my head. Okay. So sterling silver. So that was we inherited that from Steve's parents. So, yes, that's our silverware that we use for Shabbos, and it's really beautiful and all that. So we're taking our silverware. But we're taking our silver. We're taking Steve's parents with us. You know, that's different kind of taking. So when we see this word, it's like, I'm taking this mitzvah with me. I want it to be in me. I'm not, it's not like a bucket list. Okay, I did my mitzvah for the day. Like, what is that? It's like the whole thing is about to bring it in. So, and again, in the English, you never would see it. They both say with you would never notice it. And I've read it at least 65 times. I never noticed it either. So im and et, the two different ways of understanding those words. So that's the first the thing having to do with words. The second is another beautiful thing that I also never noticed. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I think this was from the same rabbi. Uh, hold on one second, I just need to let somebody in. The same rabbi, uh, Rabbi Farhi, it says, on page 375, 375, this is the description of the salvation after it had happened, but before the song of the sea. So this is chapter 14, verses 30 and 31. And what I want you to listen for is what are the Jewish, not, what are the Jewish people called? What name is here? It says, on that day, Hashem saved Israel from the hand of Egypt, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great hand that Hashem inflicted upon Egypt, and the people revered Hashem, and they had faith in Hashem and in Moses, his servant. I didn't notice anything. I would never notice this in a million years. If you don't notice anything, that's totally okay. And notice anything about this? Israel? Who's Israel? Patricia. Jacob? Yes. Yes. The Jewish people are called, if you just, if you just scan through the Torah, this Parsha, the whole thing, B'nai Israel, B'nai Israel, B'nai Israel, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, the children of Israel, the children of Israel. We have our exception of Beit Israel for the giving, uh, for the man, which is also in this chapter. And we said, okay, that means the women, the Jewish, the Jewish women, that's Beit Yisrael. But then what's this Israel here? That's the Jewish people aren't called Israel. Even Pharaoh calls the Jewish people at the beginning of Shemot. He says, B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel have become too mighty. We have to deal cleverly with them so they don't increase. We're not ever called Israel. We're called B'nai Yisrael, Beit Yisrael, Beit Yaakov whatever, Israel. So Patricia, you got it right on the mark. Only the Israel we know is Jacob. Was Jacob there? Uh, no, he's been, he died at the end of Shemot. I mean, the end of Reishi. It says, ah, oh, yes, but he was there. It says, all the patriarchs were there. All the patriarchs were there because just because they're no longer in this world doesn't mean they're not there. They were there. It says, Hashem showed them 
what it was going to be. And they all needed to be there because they needed the qualities that the patriarchs represented. So what does that even mean? So we know Jacob's name was changed to Israel, to Israel, and that was his name in the higher level of prophecy. Jacob was kind of like his day-to-day -day name, if you could say such a thing. And Israel was like his higher pro prophetic name. Going back to the splitting of the sea, and we said before that the sea was like, I'm not sure I really should be doing this. And so we know that it only did it because of Yosef, but there was another aspect too. It says, how did it split? What needed to be enacted for the Jewish people? It said, there are different qualities. There are different qualities. When we go back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we know that each of them was associated with a different spiritual quality that was manifested in their life and in their personality and their character, et cetera. Avraham was chesed, loving kindness. Remember Avraham, my door is open to everybody. He couldn't even see what was wrong with Ishmael. He was like, everybody's amazing. I love you all. Then we have Yitzchak, who is the quality of Gavura, which is the quality of no, no, no. It's the quality of judgment, which needs to also exist. And then there is Jacob. Jacob, Yisrael, is the quality of Tiferet. Tiferet is a combination of chesed and gavura in a certain magical recipe. That's what it took for the sea to split. The sea to split said, if only chesed was like on call there, the sea would say, let's save everybody. You know, the Egyptians, the Jews, they're all good. And if Gavura was the only thing that was there, judgment, din, it would be like, drown them all. Like, God, you don't need any of these people. They're on the 49th level. They're on the 50th level. Be done with them. The only thing that would work was Tiferet. Tiferet is where you have your chesed and your Gavura, because that's exactly what happened. The saving of the Jews and the drowning of the Egyptians. To be able to find, it doesn't mean mush. Okay, it's not, it's not called a gray area. There was no gray area. It was this dynamic blend of the saving of the Jews and the drowning of the Egyptians, where the drowning of the Egyptians becomes an act of chesed to the Jewish people because they got to see their enemies gone. Our, I said at the beginning of class, um, for those of you probably, most of you don't know them, but Tova Rosenfeld passed away um, just this morning. And her husband, Rabbi Yisrael Rosenfeld, uh, was, they were both Holocaust survivors. Uh, he was liberated on Tubishvat, and he always gave a talk on Shabashir, which he counted as his birthday. But, you know, many Holocaust survivors appropriately were haunted the rest of their lives by Nazis. I had a friend, a roommate in college, um, and her father had one last name, but her father's brothers had other last names. I was like, I thought maybe they were from, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. Like, I didn't know. She said they were, they were partisans and they all had false documentation with other people's names. And when they came to America, they never trusted. They didn't totally trust the world to go back to their original names. They thought the Nazis are going to come like here too. They never really trusted it. So they kept the names of the people whose identities they had while they were in the forest. The ability of the Jewish people to see the Egyptians dead and gone, not just like we like to see dead people, because we know at a Seder, we take out um, part of our wine for the suffering of the Egyptians. But what that allows the Jewish people to start fresh without being so burdened by the pain and the fear, the fear of they're going to get us, they're going to come back, they're going to catch us. To be able to see them dead and to be able to see that was a tremendous chesed a tremendous act of kindness to the Jewish people. So who's called up? Yisrael. See Jacob, your tiferet, your quality. That's what's allowing this to happen. That's what's causing the salvation. And that becomes the, the aspect that is most dominant in the whole thing having to do with the splitting of the sea. So what's interesting too, is it says in verse 30, the name of Hashem that is used. Now, God has different names also. Hashem is the name, it's called the name of Chesed. Elohim is the name of judgment. And we sometimes, we incorporate both. So like when we say, 
Baruch Ata Adonai, which is the Yudhe Vavhe name of Hashem, Eloheinu, that's the name of Elohim, we incorporate both. So we understand that. So when it says here, on that day, Hashem saved Israel, that, that's, that, that we are acknowledging that the whole thing in the end becomes an act of chesed. That when you have the chesed of Abraham, the gevura of Yitzchak, and then it's put together in this tiferet of Jacob, of Israel, that in the tiferet, then the whole thing becomes an expression of the oneness of God. It's all one picture. It just appears the good God, the mean God. It's like, there's no such thing. There are aspects, but it's all one. Like we say, in the future, Hashem will be one and his name one. And the name will be the yud Hey vav Hey name. And we'll be able to see that even something that looked like judgment was all coming from a place of love. It all comes from a place of love. It gets divided for like the practical application in this world. It's like you could say in a court, it is an act of chesed to the world that criminals are put in jail. What do we want? It would be an act of kindness to have them walking around. That's not kindness. That's terrible. It's a disgrace. So you can't let them all out. You can't have them all in. There has to be something. And the end is all considered. The system is called an act of kindness. So the splitting of the sea, including the killing of the Egyptians, was considered an act of kindness. The angels are not allowed to celebrate it. So they started to be happy about this. And God is like, why are you rejoicing? My creatures are drowning. But the Jews could because they were direct beneficiaries. To the angels, that's like just being in the, you know, in the in the stands of the of the game. It's like, what's it to you? You're not benefiting from this. You have no right to be rejoicing. The Jews can rejoice because they are the beneficiaries. They are getting something from this. This isn't just wanton destruction. This is purposeful. But you angels, if you're like celebrating this, that's a problem. So, you know. We have a very fine tooth comb that we go through life with. It's not all one thing, it's not all the other. We have to really analyze what's going on and what's happening. So we see this name of Yisrael, which I've never noticed before, doesn't fit, doesn't fit. All the other things are B'nai Israel, B'nai Israel, B'nai Israel. And then in the next, the next chapter starts off, chapter 15, verse one, then Moses and the children of Israel chose to sing. Or even when it says, going back to verse 31, Israel saw the great hand that Hashem inflicted upon Egypt and the people revered Hashem. That's the other hint for us to know that Israel is not referring to the people because it's differentiating. If it was going to be Israel was the people, it would say Israel saw the great hand that Hashem inflicted upon Egypt and Israel revered Hashem, and they had faith in Hashem and in Moses, his servant. Then you would say, no, Israel refers to the people, but it doesn't because it says the people it, and it doesn't call them Israel. So when it says Israel, we're talking about Yaakov. We're talking about Jacob, who was there. And it was his quality that allows this to happen. And it's in their merit that we were able to benefit. So we have the merit of Yaakov. We have his quality is being impacted and put into the, into the yam to split, excuse me. And we have the merit of Yosef for the Jewish people because as Moshe took those bones, Emo, with him. And not just as Yosef said, just make sure you're bringing me along. And he's like, no, I'm taking you with me. So we should all merit. To, you. We should all merit to um, have the opportunity to see every mitzvah in front of us, to take it to heart. Because who doesn't want to be, have a chacham leif? Who doesn't want to be wise hearted and to have a wise heart? Uh, we want to have a wise heart. We want to take the mitzvahs that are in front of us without knowing what their ramifications are. All we know is they're way more than we can comprehend. And we're given glimpses of this as we see in this parsha of the entire sea acting just because of that one action of Yosef who was able to go against his nature that the whole sea split because of that so who knows the things that we have set into motion we and don't people just love examples like what patricia shared about sydney poitier that we'd love to hear that and it's every once in a while the curtains part a little bit and we see that i read a story that someone sent also about um this was about an arab man 
in Israel a long time ago. He used to be the one to open up the shul and like turn on the fire or something like whatever to keep it warm for the Jewish people. And there was some sort of an attack and the shul wasn't, and he got paid for it and the shul wasn't going to open. Um, and so they didn't need the guy to do it. They, so they didn't pay him. And, and the, the rabbi said, in the future, a Jewish person is going to do something for you. And, you know, you will, you will be paid back for what you are doing for us right now. Decades, decades later, he's in the United States and he doesn't have money or whatever. And this Jewish man like pays for his, like his doctor visit or whatever. And the man says, I want to talk to you. And he said, it happened just like, like your cousin said. And the guy is like, my cousin, what did he say? He said, so he told him the story a long time. He goes, you can come to me. I know how I'm like, it was the Shabbos boy. I know how to keep the kitchen. You can, I have the tea. It's the right, it's kosher. You can have it. I have a glass, whatever. And this whole thing says, I was told that in the future, um, a Jewish person was going to pay me back when I needed it most. And you came and you fulfilled that promise. It's like, these things are everywhere. And we're so happy when we get to catch a glimpse of them. May we all be the cause of those things happening. We all for sure are beneficiaries in ways that we don't know, but hopefully we'll be the cause for all these wonderful things rippling throughout the cosmos and benefiting as many people as possible in our lifetime or later. Jacob didn't live to see this. He died in Egypt, but God brought him to the sea. We have an idea that people who passed away, they are always present. They are not in this world, but they are not gone. Even at a simcha, if the bride or the groom's parents are no longer living or even the grandparents, they are called on at the chuppah. They are like, and we welcome, you know, that they are here with us. And it's not just like, oh, we're thinking about them. No, they are itanu, they are imanu, they are with us. They are with us. So God willing, we can understand that there's so many layers of reality that we are not privy to fully comprehend or be in, but every once in a while we have a little snippet where we can have a moment of clarity. And it says in the and splitting of the sea, that the Jews had more clarity there. It says that the, the lowest handmaiden had more clarity than Ezekiel the prophet, and that it was so clear. And it's like every day we're asking for that. So it's another reason to recite the song of the sea is to say, Hashem, give me clarity for this, the challenges that are ahead of me in my day. Just give me clarity so I can make the right decision. And that's all we can ask for. We can only go as we can only do what we can do, but we want to be a chacham lev and embrace the challenges, the mitzvahs, the opportunities that are coming our way. Ladies, have a wonderful Shabbos Shira. There is a custom um, to feed birds on this Shabbos, but you don't do it on Shabbos. You put out things for them because you can't feed wild animals on Shabbos. Uh, if you have a pet, you must feed them. But if we do not feed wild animals on Shabbos, God is in charge of them. But to put out some seed or something for them before Shabbos for them to eat. And the reason is, it says that the birds did a favor. They, they made a Kiddush Hashem. They sanctified God's name. In the story of the manna, when God tells the Jewish people, I will give you a double portion on Friday, and then you will have what to eat on Friday and on Shabbos. You may not gather manna on Shabbos. It's a capital offense. So, of course, there was some, you know, there's always one in every crowd. Somebody who put out the man, their manna, their portion, out on the ground on Saturday, on Shabbos. What were their names again? I don't remember. Oh, okay. I think it might have been so it might have been um Zalafkad. It might I think it might have been um because Zalafkad's daughter. I don't quote me. I don't know. Um okay. put it out and it says that the birds ate it. And so when the Jewish people woke up and the, the plan, I don't know what they were trying to do, like make God into a liar or motion to a liar, who knows? There's always some there's one in every crowd who tries this kind of, you know, shenanigans. Anyway, the birds ate it. Now the birds. Were they like, oh, you know what? We want to really help God out here. We want to help out Moshe. So we're going to eat this manna. I was like, no, they were just being birds. Something on the ground, they ate it. Said that there's a reward for that. Even when we do what we do, and it's it's just like normal. 
we still get credit for it. There's no such thing as like it, you only get credit for something if it's really hard for you. So for sure, the harder it is, the more credit we get, but it's not like we don't get credit for the things that come easily to us. That's why it's so great we have 613 meets vote because for sure, a whole bunch of them, you're already doing without even knowing it and getting credit for it. It's like, you know, taking a test where the teacher starts you off with 15 bonus points just for, you know, picking up your pencil. It's like, you didn't even do anything. So we get the credit for it. So the birds, it says, so we, we pay the birds back. We pay the birds back. And so we feed them um, something that they can have on this Parsha. In last week's Parsha of Bo, it says there was also something we also, the reason we give dogs trafe meat, we feed dogs, you're supposed, it's a mitzvah to give dogs trafe meat. It says because they didn't bark when the Jewish people were leaving Egypt on the, for the last plague. It says, because God says not a dog will not wet its tongue. They didn't even bark. Like, did we really care if they were going to bark? Like, what's it to us? It says, I have to tell you, walking to Shul every Shabbos, we go past this one house and the dogs bark at us every single week. I can't say it like ruins my Shabbos, but you know, it does take away a little bit. It says, God wanted the experience to be only perfect for us. And the dogs are like, didn't say anything. It says, thank you dogs for doing that. And so we give you any meat that's trade, give to a dog. They deserve it. So feed the dogs, feed the birds. Not on Shabbos, you give it to them. And uh, it's like, God is keeping track of every little tiny thing. It's not like, well, I don't hope he doesn't notice this one. Like I'm sitting in my basement, so he probably won't see me. Uh, which is the other thing about Yosef and his um, action is nobody saw him. Nobody would have known. He could have just carried on. Who would know? You know, his father didn't have like a camera in his room. Like he wasn't gonna know. He didn't have like a babysitter watch. Nobody would have known. So that's where we're tested the most. Is right. in private. Mm -hmm. And we say every morning that we should be God-fearing. We should be God-fearing in, in, um, in private and in public. A lot of public figures, amazing in the public and what they're doing behind closed doors, thinking that that's going to be okay, not okay. So the righteousness of Joseph not only was righteous, and it wasn't just a, it wasn't a public act. It was an incredibly private, intimate act that nobody ever would have known, except God sees everything. So, and now it's recorded for all of posterity. So we only think of it as being a public act because we read about it every year. But at the time, it was not a public act. This would have been very private. The Torah specifically says no one was home except for Potiphar's wife and Joseph. Sounds like a key opportunity. Would have been amazing. But uh, he didn't do it. All right, ladies. Yes, Andy. I'm sorry. I no. missed. What did the birds do to favor they, for Hashem? They ate the manna that this right. Israelite put out on the ground right. on Saturday. To, and so they ate it so it wasn't there. So when the Jews woke up on Saturday morning, this man thought like, oh, I'm going to, whatever he was trying to do, I'm going to show that you can have manna. You, there is manna on Shabbos. Who knows why? The birds destroyed the evidence. The birds Thanks. destroyed the evidence, but they didn't destroy it intentionally. They did it just because they're birds. And it's like, okay, that's great. You can also get credit for doing things that you just do. Yes, Renee. Um, oh, sorry. So I learned that one of those two men that spread the manna on, the, on Shabbos to try and um, make everybody believe that, you know, Moses was lying. One of them was, was, the slave that Moses protected and kept him from being being killed. And um, that slave who Moses protected, he's the one that went off to Pharaoh and said, hey, your son, you know, Moshe, um, say, you know, killed a slave and wow. he killed an Egyptian. Wow. I just wanted to mention that. I don't know the deep spiritual meaning about this constant connection. I think there's something there, obviously, but I just wanted to mention that. Definitely a case of ingratitude. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> you saved me and I turn you in. Amazing. Yeah. And, that's, and so he and somebody else, and I forgot his name, are the two people that wanted to try and deceive the Jewish people not to believe in Hashem and in Moshe. You know, as I said, you got to always have those people in your life <laughs> that are trying to put a wrinkle <laughs> into everything. My goodness. Poor Moshe. <sighs> 
these people. You haven't even gotten started yes. yet. So yes. <laughs> thank you. All right, ladies, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much. Thank Have you, a Ellen. Wonderful, wonderful show. Thank you, Ellen. Good show. Thank you. All right. Thank take you. good care. Thank you. Bye. Ellen, do you have two minutes to stay I on do. by any chance? I do. Thank okay. you. Do you want to stop the recording? I don't know if you want to stop the recording. I will stop the recording. Thank you. I don't know if Renee wants the 